Y'all are so quiet. Good morning. Ah, today of all days, it is a joy to be together. If you're visiting with us, we uh, welcome you. Thank you for being here. And I say to you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Just as he said. Just as he said. Just as he said. He spelled it out and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. That's so clear and it's such a delight to gather here because if he said that and he did that, we can believe that he will do everything else he said. So welcome. Uh, I received a, a note this morning from the Kamaus and they said, uh, please send our greetings to, to the church. So it's, um, it's great for us to be here together and it was an encouragement to even receive that note for those who don't have the privilege of of gathering together with a, a group of fellow believers on this level so we thank the Lord for that. I want to draw your attention to some announcements and uh, received word about Gary Smith's uh, mom dying this past week and so Keep, uh, keep them in your prayers. Connect with uh, Gary and Judy as you have opportunity. There in your bulletin, you see that beginning this Friday are the VBS prep days. And so uh, if you can be involved in them, there's information there. You can also speak with, with Cassie Gautier. Here in April, CMC Family Bowling Outing. There's information there. Also for today's uh, for today's service, on the back of the bulletin, parents, if you have children who are um, kindergarten through first grade, there won't be children's church this morning. So, be ye warned. So, uh, it is the last Sunday of March, and so the last Sunday of the month, we like to recognize wedding anniversaries. Was anyone, was anyone married in March? Oh, the Reesmans. I have a very good feeling you're going to win. I didn't see any other hands. How many years? 49. 49 years. Do you have big plans for, for next year? <laughs> hint, hint, huh? Oh, Laura. How, how many how many years? Five years. Five years and two little ones. It's been a, a fun ride. Wonderful. Congratulations, congratulations. Thank you. And I'm doing a scan here. You know how they say that it's rude to ask a lady how old she is? A apparently it's not when you turn 90 because we just advertise it. And, and Joyce Bernhardt of the uh, Faithful Fergs family there, um, Joyce turned 90 on Good Friday. Is that accurate? That's what I heard. These are just vicious rumors. <laughs> and is our practice, we like, we'd like to sing to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Rick, last week I called on you to make an announcement you didn't know you were making. I hope that's not the case this week. A little bit. Good morning, everyone. As I mentioned last week, um, Pastor Falk is retiring effective tomorrow. 
So this is his last official day on the payroll, um, as it were. But um, in, in, this is not easy. They've been with us for so many years. So we're, we're so blessed that they're going to remain with us. So just thinking about their history here at Calvary, they came, they began July 1st of 2001, if I'm not mistaken, so just short of 23 years. I see some faces here that are saying, wow, didn't know that many years had passed. 23 years of ministry at CMC, including family ministries, teaching, preaching, counseling, serving as an elder, Christian education, uh, he was on the committee and, and guiding that committee, visitation, music ministry, worship service planning, administration, and a host of upper, other operational tasks. In short, he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He has taught 38 unique Sunday school series, including eight Bible books and 30 topical studies. He's visited our members in hospitals, care facilities, and those who were homebound. As I mentioned earlier, he's, been a, he's served as an elder for many years, faithfully. He managed our vulnerable persons program, and we know him well. We know that he loves God. He is a faithful man. He is a man of integrity, perseverance, winsomeness. I think all of us will agree there. He's wise. Um, his scriptural and spiritual insights have been helpful to all. His care and concern for the flock, his passion to always reflect the life of Christ. That's what I think of, of Pastor Fall. And Patty, she also has faithfully served this church for just short of 23 years in women's ministries, a variety of ministries, including children's church, Sunday school, Awana, VBS, speaking at women's events like Christmas tea and, the, and mug and muffin. And she's joined Pastor Falk on visitations as well. They are dear brothers and sisters in Christ, dear friends, dear colleagues, faithful servants. Um, for the younger ones here, if you're looking for examples, and that's a good thing, look for examples in the Christian faith, those who you can pattern after. Psalm 37, 37, mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. Those of us that know the folks know that they are people of peace. As far as following in their examples, um, Philippians 3.17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. 1 Peter 5.3, speaking to elders, be examples to the flock, not domineering over those in your charge. So thankfully, tomorrow morning will come and they'll still be with us. But uh, please take a moment to thank them for their many years of service. Um, that's not the, today is not the only day that you're able to do that. But I'd like to pray for them as they launch into retirement. So please join me. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are that uh, uh, when, when we consider the folks, we see the life of Jesus. And that is good for us to see. It has been good. And we're grateful, Father, that as you tarry and as your will uh, becomes more fully known, we'll still have that joy of being in fellowship with them. We ask that you would bless them in their retirement, Father, as they launch out into this next chapter of their lives, that they would um, receive the, uh, get the rest and, uh, the, that they would need and the time to be able to spend with family in distant places. We're grateful, Father, for your working through them all these years, and we ask that that would continue, and we ask your blessing on their lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Pastor Falk, there was the, uh, or Pat, I'm supposed to call you that. Um, <laughs> I had a dream about you after the announcement last week. I mean, it wasn't one of those dreams where, like, the responsible thing to do is to wake up and call yourself and have yourself committed. It, it, was, it was a normal weird dream. And I don't remember what was happening, but you and I were just laughing. And I, and I think we, we, we do a lot of that. Um, hopefully it's like 
good humor and, and not like the maniacal laughter of like the mentally not quite stable. <laughs> but uh, yes, thank you for uh, your care for me. Thank you for your care for our church. And really, how often do you get to sit and hear people eulogize you? And you're still alive. <laughs> I will draw your attention to this in the bulletin. As Pastor Falk is changing in the, uh, in the ministry he has, uh, he'll be heading up a visitation team. So that's there in your bulletin and, uh, and is well described there. And I would encourage your participation there and, and thank you for his, uh, his oversight there. Our scriptural call to worship comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a, what a treasured message this is. We call you our Heavenly Father, and we can approach you because of Jesus Christ. I thank you that you receive us and you accept us because his sacrifice was received by you and was acceptable as he gave his life for the sins of humanity. We praise you that this was your plan. We praise the Son for being obedient to you and paying our eternal sin debt. We praise the Holy Spirit for revealing to us the Savior and for drawing us to the Father through faith in the Son. We remember today the, the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we praise you and we thank you for saving all who trust in his finished work. All glory be to you, our great God. We praise you now and we will praise you forever because of Jesus Christ. And we thank you and we approach you in his name. Amen.
Please take your supplement hymn book and turn to number 15. Alleluia, what a Savior. I ask you if you're able to stand for this hymn and also for this scripture immediately following. Scripture reading for today is Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Take your copy of the scriptures or you can follow along in the Pew Bible on page 525. We find ourselves in the garden with some droopy-eyed disciples. Matthew 25, 26, I'm sorry, Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is the word of the Lord.
Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus that 
paved the way for us to be redeemed, forgiven of our sins, and restored to relationship with the Father. We pray that we would remember what it cost for us to be redeemed. Thank you, and we give our lives to you. And as a token of that sacrifice and commitment, we give you gifts to the work, to continue the work of the, of the ministry of this church and the ministry of the gospel around the world for your glory. In Jesus' name. Please rise for our next reading. We'll be reading today from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. You can find that on page 527 of the Pew Bible. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, 
as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met with them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing for the next hymn. Our hymn is number 207, Low in the Grave He Lay.
And please turn in your hymn books to hymn number 194, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, hymn number 194, and uh, let's stand as we sing.
Stands an endless mercy tree Every broken, weary soul Find your rest and be made whole Stripes of blood that stain its frame Shed to wash away our shame from the scars pure love released salvation by the mercy tree in the sky between
What a morning. I know that music isn't the, the, the focus of this isn't the music, but there's so much that's communicated in, in the message there. And without naming names, I, I, I know how many are encouraged by, by the music ministry here. And thank you for the very many of you who are involved in this. Um, Thank you, Maus. I suppose I just named names, but um, thank you, Maus, for uh, your very thoughtful care of of these things. It is interesting that there will be aspects of things that we forget, but there will be someone who doesn't remember many things and... And you, but they'll still remember the words to a song. And so thank you for uh, helping us to be well taught through, through music and uh, a day of all days. This is what, uh, this was the day music was uh, written for. <laughs> so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us something to sing about. And we thank you for the uh, the fact that you have uh, given us an answer that the answer for every soul, every soul that wants to belong, every soul that wants to be loved, every soul that desires, even though I know in myself I'm not worthy, I desire to be treasured. And we thank you that that comes through Jesus Christ and and that comes through the cross. So we thank you so much for our Savior who died for us in obedience. And we thank you that he has risen from the dead. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. To assume is to function with an understanding that may very well not be accurate. And so we could say, well, then don't assume, but everybody assumes. Not only does everyone assume, but in our assuming, we assume that our assumptions are sound. So if you think about that, that's kind of rather circular in its reasoning. But we assume that we have the full picture. We assume that we see things clearly, 
nearly to the point that we could predict the end from the beginning. Have you ever said to yourself, oh, I know what they're thinking. I know what they're thinking, and we can even convince ourselves that we then are sure that what they're going to do, and we all but know how this is all going to shake out. But assumptions actually inhibit us from seeing things clearly. If you've been here in recent weeks, we have seen how the disciples, the disciples of Jesus Christ, were commanded by their assumptions. And in this, we would do well to not put on our own judgy tone and say, well, what a bunch of dopes. But instead, we should check our own assumptions because everyone assumes. And we should surrender those assumptions to be shaped by the authority of the Word of God rather than hanging our assumptions on Well, this is the way I see it. Because, quite frankly, who cares about the way that I see it? I know that I'm particularly concerned about that, but I may very well be wrong. And so the question is, what actually is? That is what matters, and for that we turn to God and his word. I've been thinking... Hopefully not surprisingly, I've been thinking much of the scene at the cross. We won't recap what we covered on Friday, but suffice suffice to say it was a pitiable scene, degrading the humanity of all involved. The different gospel writers note details from their unique perspectives. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write of the mockery that comes from those on the ground, the chief priests, the elders, scribes, and passerbys. Matthew records the jeers in Matthew 27. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. If he is the King of Israel, Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him, let God deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Note the arrogance of these statements. And a further caution is there to not interject our own assumptions and place our own qualifiers of validation upon God. If you are the Son of God, how is that for a doubt-filled qualifier? You can can hear the pessimism pervading all of these comments. If you are the Son of God, what was happening there? I will lay out the conditions, how you can prove yourself to me. It will be to my liking or it will not be valid. If you are the son of man, come down from the cross. If he is the king of Israel, here is the parameter I set. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. Do this and then we'll believe That will be your prize. If you do this, then we will believe. And dear people, we can do the same thing. God, if you respond as I outline, then I will acknowledge you. In Luke 27, after Pilate first tried Christ, and concluded, I find no fault in this man. We're told that Pilate then passed Jesus Christ off to Herod for him to deal with, because this was one from his own jurisdiction. And in verse 8 of Luke 23, we read, Now when Herod saw Jesus, 
he was exceedingly glad. Why? He's curious. For he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. We find the same sentiment as Jesus Christ hung on the cross. Bring on the sideshow. Come on down from the cross. Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Just, just don't, don't intervene. Just, just wait. Maybe something cool will happen. Something that interests, interests me. Something that's according to my liking. If he is the victim, then we're in charge. If he's the victim, I get to call the shots. He is beholden to me. This spoken to the king and sustainer of the universe, and it is no different today. The thought that God answers to me. Let us not be deceived. Each one of us are capable of the same baseless arrogance. Thinking God answers to me rather than the other way around. So the religious leaders before the cross presumptuously concluded he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Assuming Jesus Christ to be no more than a victim. Assuming that he is powerless under their control. That he is somehow dependent upon their acceptance and he would be ruined by their rejection. One who could be conquered by shady dealings and cowardly plans that are made and carried out in darkness. That he would be able to be silenced by their plotting and their wicked manipulation of sound justice. The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, detail the comments coming from those watching the crucifixion and were commenting on a, a truly terrible scene. It is human cruelty pompously displayed, suffering and desperation. And if that's not enough, there's, there's malevolence heaped upon this already palpable misery. And, it, and it's sort of a little surprising, but even the criminals are parroting some of the taunting remarks they heard from those below. Luke focuses on this. He focuses on those words that are exchanged between those being crucified. In Luke 23, Luke focuses on the words exchanged between those who hung on the cross, reporting in verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Naturally, this was not spoken for Christ's benefit. He was not passing along well wishes but he was doing so for his own sake. How understandable and relatable that he wanted to escape the cross. Yet even in the midst of a scenario where the criminal, think about this, the criminal had virtually no freedoms at this point. Yet even being in that place, he laid out his own challenge and his own stipulations for Jesus to perform according to his standards and saved a lot of them. The, there, is no, there is no limit to the arrogance of humanity. These were desperate, angry, pointed, accusative cries that were hurled at the Son of God. Yet as time wore on and death approached, 
Luke records a change in one of the criminals. He goes from himself hurling insults upon Jesus Christ, as Matthew and Mark record, but he switches even to the point where he rebuked his fellow criminal in verse 40 of Luke 23, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Here he is acknowledging the reality of impending death and accountability to God. Hey, man, we're, we're all dying here. And that is true for each one of us here. But he goes on and he said, uh, do you not even fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. We got what we had coming to us. But this man has done nothing wrong. That's quite a statement. That's quite a, an expression of understanding. That is an expression of belief, of faith. For this one hanging alongside Jesus Christ, his hardened, angry cries had softened and ceased. And dear people, that, that is the response that I hope many will have today. He spoke not at Jesus, but to Jesus. He spoke to Jesus, and it's interesting because I don't think he regarded him as a victim, but a victor. So he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, in the midst of his own turmoil, in the midst of his own suffering, in the midst of being punished for our sins, which is something none of us could understand. In the midst of that, he responds as ever with grace, saying, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When it comes to the cross, do we assume Jesus Christ was a victim? As with Christ in the cradle, many look at Christ on the cross and see vulnerability, that maybe he's not as tough as we thought he was. And that can be sort of comforting because we can, we can sort of think to ourselves, hey, you know, he, he, he's a little powerless. He's a little, he's a little weak. And, and, and in that setting, we could somehow see ourselves as above him. I will pity you. But does such a view fit the account of the Gospels? We spent time in Luke and in chapter 9 and in other places. Jesus Christ repeated with increasing detail what lay ahead in Jerusalem. The rejection, betrayal, suffering, death, and resurrection. And after that, after he talked about that, in verse 51 he said, it says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In the words of Isaiah, he set his face like flint and set off for Jerusalem. He was undeterred by the trials he knew. He, he didn't imagine, he didn't wonder. It was the trials he knew were to come. How often do we think about a situation and we're like, oh, oh, that's gonna be terrible. Oh, I bet this is gonna happen. Oh, this could be so bad. And, and we guess, and we assume, and we wonder. Jesus Christ didn't do that. He knew. He knew what was coming. He didn't set off with this, well, we'll see how this goes. No, he, he knew what was coming, 
and he looked it in the eye. And he's like, all right, guys, let's go. The guy in me wants to be like, what a man. Everything about the cross, and especially the farce of a trial leading up to it, was intentionally heavy with desperation. John 19 describes the scene where Pilate is trying to figure out what to do with Jesus Christ. He has already had him scourged to fulfill the the bloodlust of the mob. So he just has the ever-loving tar beat out of him. But even that didn't satisfy them. And, And Pilate came in to speak to Jesus Christ. And he says, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Verse 10, then Pilate said to him, are you, <laughs> are you not speaking to me? Do you not understand that I have the power to crucify? I have the power to crucify you or the power to release you. Jesus answered, you could have no power against me at all unless it had been given you from above. <sighs> That's my Lord. What did Pilate think Jesus Christ to be? A victim. And we see that in his response to Christ as he stood before the king of glory and said in effect, you're not going to contend with me? I am in control here. And Jesus Christ effectively responds, no, you're not. In John 10, Jesus Christ said, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father When we think about the cross, if we think about Jesus Christ being a victim, that communicates that he did not do it so willingly, that that was somehow out of his hands. No, we saw on Good Friday that Jesus Christ laid his life down. And today on Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that he took it back up again. Raising from the dead conquering death, securing our salvation and our hope of eternal eternal life, doing everything that he said he was going to do, just like he said he was going to do it, despite all the assumptions about him to the contrary. He is no victim He is the victor. What do you say he is? Who do you say he is? Do I answer to him? Or do I think that he answers to me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is just amazing. This is just amazing. This is a story that is so great, it could only be divine. I pray that we would see you rightly and respond to you appropriately. We thank you for our risen Savior. I pray we would uh, move forward with confidence and delight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
uh, we have a long-standing tradition at Calvary Memorial Church of, of singing Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus uh, at the end of the service, and we're going to do that now. So I would like to ask the choir to come on up, um, and anyone else that that is in the congregation that may not have been singing in the choir this morning, but would like to sing the Messiah, uh, the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah, come on up. And uh, the books are on the side. For you, those of you grabbing a book, it's page 193. It's a big book. And it's not the last one in the book. And has, has been the tradition for hundreds of years, I would ask that you stand as we sing the Hallelujah.
That was wonderful. I'll confess that I sang every part in that. <laughs> Sopranos, I was on there and some of that, and just wherever it fits, you know. Uh, that was delightful. So good to be together. We, of all people, have a reason to celebrate. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.